Hey everybody, uh, thanks for joining today. Uh, my name is Maggie Colley. I'm serving as the Executive Director for OpenStreetMap US. I'm joined today by my colleagues, Quincy, who I'm gonna leave, our tech lead, and Jess Bueller, our program director. Um, today, we're gonna be talking a little bit about OpenStreetMap and on the public domain. Um, I know we don't have time to do around the room introductions, but I always like to know where everyone's coming from. So if you want to, uh, please introduce yourself in the chat uh, so we get a sense of who's in the room and where we might overlap, not only geographically, but you know, in our, our work. So um, we're going to leave time for an open discussion at the end. So have your questions ready uh, and hopefully we can have um, more of a, a group vibe than, than just uh, us talking at you for this hour. So. Uh, with that, I will pull up my presentation. All right. Um, so, in this show of hands, who has heard of OpenStreetMap? I can't see you, but you can use your reactions. Um, yes, I see some hands. That's great. Uh, OpenStreetMap, if you haven't heard of it or you're not quite completely sure, it's a cloud pro collaborative project to create a free editable world map. It's crowdsourced, it's open source, and anyone can use the data. Um, we're up to millions of editors all over the world. Um, and there's, there's local communities all over the United States as well. Um, so how it works, you know, there's contributors adding the data, volunteers, governments, and other entities, corporations all contribute data to OpenStreetMap. Uh, they develop open source tools, they monitor quality. Um, governments often provide authoritative data for import. Um, so the data goes into OpenStreetMap and then it's used. Um, any number of users, I do usually have a slide up of all of the companies and governments and everything using them, but um, you name one probably is using it. So uh, humanitarian nonprofit organizations, um, Red Cross, Doctors Without Borders. Uh, I think we're almost to 30,000 companies, including ones you're probably familiar with. Amazon uses it to deliver all your packages, um, Uber to, to run the logistics on their cars. Uh, Tesla has it built in. Um, you probably look at a Craigslist map. It's it's run by OpenStreetMap. Governments rely on it. Um, and then if you look at a map on, on many of journalist websites, journalism websites, Washington Post, New York Times, that will be driven by an OpenStreetMap base map. That said, it's it's way more than just a map. Um, it is a thriving community of contributors. Um, we are a global ecosystem. Uh, one thing that I love about it is if any place you go in the world, you could probably find an open street mapper and you have pretty much an immediate friend, uh, not to sound corny, but it, it is really neat how it connects people around the world. Um, and it also acts as an on-ramp for digital literacy and representation. Uh, getting started to map in OpenStreetMap is pretty straightforward. And if you have a computer and a mouse in a few minutes, um, anyone can become a contributor. So um, if you haven't done it, I encourage you to go ahead and sign up for that account and, and give it a try. It's it's a very it's becoming a very mature project. It's in its 19th year. Um, and it's become a common operating data set for governments, companies, and citizens around the world. Uh, the schema allows you to map the same um, attributes and features from you know, Tahiti to Tallahassee, right? So it's, it's the same across the world, which provides really good base for um, being that common operating data set and, and language for those different places um, to come together. It provides an avenue for citizen engagement. Uh, I will map what I'm interested in. There's no one telling me what I can put on the map. So it really provides um, an avenue for that digital democracy and in a way for folks to collect the data and contribute what they see important to the map and find that digital representation. Um, and again, going back to that common operating data set, it's it's efficient um, and it's it's innovative. You know, when you have millions of people contributing to a commons, it really creates a lot of room for innovation um, and, you know, leveraging the power of the crowd to respond to disasters or collect data for a town. Um, in in February, we did a call to map Puxitani in, in honor of Groundhog Day, and it was mapped the town of Puxitani, all the buildings were mapped by the end of February. So I think that called for an early spring, <laughs> but it just really shows um, the power of the crowd to come together and, and get things done. Um, so 
You may have heard of OpenStreetMap, but you might not have heard of OpenStreetMap US. Uh, we are a US-based nonprofit and we advocate for um, and support stakeholders within the OpenStreetMap ecosystem in the US. Um, we are working on improving accessibility and interoperability of open data between government, tech, and the public, and you know, bringing all those stakeholders together to solve problems um, and work together for even more impact through OpenStreetMap. Um, we have a few initiatives that are listed on the slide. Uh, Teach OSM works to bring uh, geospatial learning into classrooms across the country through OpenStreetMap. Um, so we educate educators to how to you know, inc incorporate OpenStreetMap and open uh, data into their curriculum, no matter what they're teaching. We have a charter project program. So it's a fiscal sponsorship program where we bring in tech projects and um, support them within the OSM ecosystem, uh, mapping for impact. Uh, we actually have a New York partner. Uh, we're mapping swimming pools across the state. Uh, and you know, with that mapping for impact program, you know, if if a nonprofit or local organization wants to collect data to um, support their cause, we help to do that. We help to mo mobilize OpenStreetMap volunteers to collect that data, so it's available for that nonprofit to use. Lots of events. Um, we'll announce to you at the end of this talk, but we we convene online and annually at our our conference, State of the Map US, in person. Um, and we often have monthly mappy hours. So uh, if you enjoy today, there's always more <laughs> to join us on. And finally, we're we're working on something called the Trail Stewardship Initiative, which I will talk about a little bit later. So today I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, one of those pieces is the convening. So this is a picture from our State of the Map Conference in 2019. And that brings together all of those stakeholders that I mentioned, you know, the contributors, the data users, um, the innovators on the tools. Um, and we had a panel that looked at government use of OpenStreetMap and how we might improve those collaborations. Um, so this panel was charged with, how do you navigate the OpenStreetMap license? Could crowdsourcing and authoritativeness exist in the same room? Um, what would that collaboration look like? You know, where in the world is the collaboration already happening between OpenStreetMap and government? Um, and how do we find those mutually beneficial relationships uh, between the public and open data communities? As you can imagine, it was a lot to fit into an hour long panel. So um, it was very clear that we needed to talk about this some more and there was a lot of room for growth. So we created our government working group, gosh, August, 2020 now, it's been a while, uh, to continue to explore these issues. Um, it's been a really a great space for conversation and just building those relationships upon which you know any solutions would be formed. So these are some of the things that we talk about. We have a monthly meeting. Um, and through this collaboration, a few projects were born. Um, oh, <laughs> I forgot about this slide. So, you know, our first meeting was 15 people. And I thought, we're really getting a lot of people in the room. And then I, you know, looked at the list of all of the agencies within the United States government and <laughs> had a little work to do. Um, but we're now up to, to 60 representatives uh, across state, local, federal agencies, um, some company representation and, and some nonprofit in academia. So it's it's been a really uh, great collaboration. A couple of initiatives that were born from it, um, public domain map, uh, I'll dive into that in a second, uh, but you know, thinking about that goal of um, interoperability and collaborating on the data side, and then the trail stewardship initiative. So public domain map, I'll start with that. Um, through those conversations over the years, we found that, you know, like I said, governments could bring their authoritative data into OpenStreetMap, um, but there wasn't always that two-way street. So, you know, they could bring it in, but because of license, um, all federal data has to be released in the public domain and OpenStreetMap's license is ODBL. So what we had to figure out how do we, how do we contribute to both, um, but honor those licenses and bring those parallel efforts into something combined. So PD map objectives were born. Um, how do we would like to fill gaps for both OpenStreetMap and the US government. Um, we wanna improve the interoperability between the data and the user groups. Um, any government folks here know that word authoritative is very, can be very important. So 
how do we create that level of review of the data, even if it's crowdsourced? Um, and then again, respect both those licenses. So we just launched public domain map last month. Um, this is the workflow. Um, our current pilot, I'll give this as an example, is with the Federal Railroad Administration. Um, they identified a need to map railroad tunnels in Colorado. Um, so we created those tasks, which Quincy will show you in a minute. Um, the volunteers will map the data. And then once it's mapped, there's a stage that will allow that authoritative review by the agency. So if the FRA says, yes, this is good data, they can, they can download that data and use it for their needs in the public domain. And then that data can be fed back in OpenStreetMap um, to be used by everyone. If it's not good, it'll go back to the mapper, be fixed, and um, kind of go back around until until it meets that that review. That pilot was created. We had kind of three legs of the stool. We had the the user agency that needed the data, um, and a really great community in the United States around railroads. There's a very active railroad mapping community in the United States, and also the National Map Corps, USGS National Map Corps was interested in getting involved in this to start mapping. So um, that was the partnership. All right, enough of me talking. How about we see how it works? <laughs> I will stop sharing my screen. Quincy, you want to take over? Sure. Uh, okay, cool. Um, so good morning, everybody. I think it's still morning. And um, Today I'll be demoing the uh, the public domain map tool in use. And what you're looking at right now is our uh, tasking manager. If you go to tasks.openstreetmap.us right now, you can see the live tasking manager. And um, this is how we divvy up um, work among groups in OpenStreetMap. So if I go over to explore projects, then you'll see all these green tasks are OpenStreetMap tasks, which um, there's all sorts of things that different users, different groups um, have requested help with. Here's one for mapping for impact, um, mapping swimming pools in New York City for the Rising Tide Effect nonprofit. Um, but we can also use this tool to map in the public domain. And this allows uh, government entities to request uh, crowdsourced data that has a more permissive license than ODBL, which is the OpenStreetMap database license. But because it's more permissive, that data can also go back into OpenStreetMap at the end of the day. Um, so here's one example of a pilot we're running. Um, so not anybody can map this. This is just uh, our testing at this, at this point. Um, but it looks very similar to any OpenStreetMap project, but of course, um, it goes into a different database. And because of that, um, there's it's a, it's a whole different um, uh, set of set of use and uh, use cases that we can apply it to. Um, so right here, this this is a stretch of rail line in Colorado. And uh, if we contribute to that, then we can see um, the editor. See, this has already been mapped mostly. Oh, I guess we're, <laughs> the government server is missing a tile there on the imagery. That's all right. Um, and if we zoom in, we can see uh, the rail line and people have checked it to see where the tunnels are. Um, and normally these imagery tiles would be uh, filled in <laughs> with the actual imagery. Um, so to, to give you a, a broader sense of how this could be used, um, let's go ahead and create a new project. Um, so if I was the project manager for this, or if I was a representative that of a government agency, I might be able to use this tool. Or OpenStreetMap US could also um, set up a, a mapping campaign. Um, so let's say I uh, am a small town manager in uh, maybe upstate New York, and I want to get a certain feature map like sidewalks. And this could be very time consuming to pay people to map, um, resource intensive, but if you could bump this task out to the crowd, then you can take advantage of mappers all around the world who want to, to, want to help um, get involved in um, open data in the government. So all you have to do is to draw a task around the area. In this case, Oswego, New York. Um, 
And there's a number of options that we can use to customize uh, the tasks. But we're going to break it into little squares to, um, to split up the mapping tasks. Looks good. We'll call this sidewalks in Oswego. And then we pick a um, an organization. In this case, um, I'm actually going to put it under the FRA, which is not correct, but um, it's just a demo. And we're going to pick the, open, the public domain map database. And now we're in the back end. As I, as I said before, there's a, a, a large number of options, but we're going to go ahead, go ahead and, and just fill in the required information. And that'll let us start mapping. Um, and we're going to limit it so people can only add sidewalks. Cool. Now that has been saved. Let's go take a look at it. And right away, we have the, um, the task live in Tasking Manager, and I can start contributing to it. Um, so Tasking Manager will assign me a random task, but I, or I can just pick the one I want. Oh, it looks like I has already locked that other task. So Tasking Manager tries to be very careful about um, what's going on um, to make sure that users don't make mistakes. So I'll jump back in. So I'm going to switch the imagery. There we go. And if you're totally new to mapping, then um, you might wonder how we do it. Uh, one of the best ways to do it is to just trace aerial imagery. And in this case, it want, I want to map sidewalks. So I would use a line feature. And from the imagery, I can see there's a sidewalk here. And I can just put that on the map, select the type of the feature. And there we go. Um, I've mapped the first sidewalk. Uh, this imagery is relatively low resolution, but of course we can use any public domain imagery in a lot of states and counties and even municipalities will take um, aerial imagery. Or there's also some open options for that where people can take their own imagery using uh, drones or whatnot. Um, so let's say um, I'm lazy and I, and I don't, uh, don't want to keep mapping. Or I'm a vandal and I just throw in, you know, random features and totally try to screw things up. And I say, yes, this is totally mapped. Um, and I go ahead and save that data. I'm about to log in here. And then we'll grant access to my account. So it'll throw some warnings, but that's all right because I'm a vandal and I'll uh, save that up. Cool. And now the data is in our database for, um, anyone to be able to use and I'll submit the task and then I'll be all set if I were a mapper, but I can also valid, go ahead and validate the task. Um, so if I went back in here, uh, oh, it looks like I can't uh, validate a task that I already mapped. But if I were to go back in and it'll say, was this map, is this task completely validated? I could go up and look at the data and say, no, this is terrible data. And I would say, no, that's not completely uh, valid. Um, and that's how we can create authoritative data through crowdsourcing is by um, having trusted reviewers go in and check the data um, to make sure it's up to whatever standards that that organization has. And then when the data is completely uh, mapped and validated, then it's available to the government um, for use in all sorts of public programs and also available to OpenStreetMap or any database around the world, any user around the world to use that information. Um, so I think that about wraps up my demo, but I'm, uh, so I'll throw it back over to Maggie. And I'm also, you know, available for questions in the chat. Excellent. <clears throat> Thanks, Quincy. We'll definitely can show that again later too, if anyone has questions. Um, all right, demo time is, is over for now. <laughs> so what's next steps? Um, I saw some questions pop up in the chat. Um, we launched the prototype earlier this year, and we're currently in our first phase of user testing with the pilot that I showed you with the FRA. Um, it's probably about halfway through. Uh, the next phase will be another pilot um, with our trail stewardship initiative, which I'll talk about in a second, um, and then kind of a full workflow development and testing, and then creating that onboarding. So eventually this will open up to, to anyone who wants to request to become a public domain map um, admin and create those tasks. Uh, but we will have an onboarding process to make sure that you know that there's that review process and that, that everyone's um, to speed on how it all works.
So taking a step back, the Trail Stewardship Initiative is another project of, of OpenStreetMap US. Um, it was started in the fall of 2021 when I, I received an email from um, someone at the National Park Service in Utah, um, kind of saying, you know, there's been an unprecedented number of hikers this year in our national parks. Um, and a lot of folks are not relying anymore on those really good National Park Service paper maps, but rather coming out with, you know, Strava or Caltopo or all trails on their phones and, and relying on uh, digital maps through those apps to navigate our, our public lands. And this is creating a lot of problems because not they're not always uh, aligned with the authoritative data on the ground. Um, and there's, they're causing ecological damage and people are getting hurt or lost. Um, and what the National Park Service person said that is a lot of this data is coming directly from OpenStreetMap and what are we gonna do about it? Uh, so as I mentioned before, it's a global project. It's a very huge ecosystem of people, but OpenStreetMap US thought, you know, what, what can we do about it? We have a responsibility here. Um, so we, created uh, a working group through that and you know all these interested stakeholders came together from the app companies from from the land management perspective and from um, the volunteers so you know avid trail mappers in OpenStreetMap are also part of this group and we've been working over the past year to um, create tagging and rendering guidelines so if I'm a mapper, what's the best way to tag a trail if it's used for this or that, or you know, if it's a social trail, so that it doesn't end up as a bold line on those rendering apps. Um, this could be its own, its own talk, so I, I won't dive too deeply into the details, but if you're interested in this, um, please ping us at the end and I can share more. Um, so with that initiative, we've come up with these best practices for tagging trails um, and rendering guidelines, and we've done one pilot in Washington State and in our next phase, we're going to do a second pilot using um, PDMAP and testing the, the fitness for use of PDMAP for mapping trails in the US alongside federal, state, and local partners, um, mappers, and these, these industry uh, partners. The main goal for this is going to map every trail in the United States, so you know, no small potatoes. <laughs> so here's a, a rendering of that before and after after this area was um, updated with tagging and then re-rendered in, this is an all trails uh, rendering. So you can see before when, when you see all the little trails, they all kind of have the same weight in the cartography um, right here. But then once it's updated, all of those non-main trail segments have become diminished. Uh, so we sent this to the land managers in the area and they were, overall pretty pleased with the results. So it was a successful first pilot. Um, and now we wanna improve that workflow to uh, allow us to expand across the country. So two workflows that would use public domain map. Um, I don't know if anyone's familiar with the Maplands Act, but it, it requires a lot of federal agencies to digitize their trails. Um, and so if those trails are missing and they're not digitized at all in any public repository, those agencies could use public domain map to create the digital versions of those by tracing on authoritative trail data maps, you know, geo-referenced. Or uh, if they're already there, we could improve the data in OpenStreetMap um, and OpenStreetMappers could, could use those authoritative references to add tags or additional metadata to um, its existing in OpenStreetMap. Here's an, a kind of a mock-up of um, a 1988 USDS County Lands Topo. Um, you can see this, this trail line here um, was digitized. So we just you know, traced that trail and now it's a digital map. <laughs> so this is one idea of, of how it could be used, but this is what we'd be testing over the coming months um, to get additional information of how it, it functions uh, for those users. So that's, that's where I'll stop uh, with both those initiatives. Um, it'd be great to see all of you again. So uh, we have a meetup tonight, actually. It's GeoLadies Meetup, um, if you'd like to join us. We are gonna be having uh, both a civic tech and a recreation track at our upcoming State of the Map US conference, which will begin Richmond, Virginia. Our call for proposals is open. If anyone on this, this meeting would be interested in speaking, I encourage you to submit a talk um, or just join us in Richmond. And we have a very active Slack channel 
uh, you're welcome to join and any number of talk topics are there. There's a local NYC channel uh, to meet other interested map enthusiasts uh, in your area. And we also have a Twitter account. So uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. And I'd like to leave it open for discussion and questions. Good, we have about half an hour. So I'm hoping people want to talk about this. <laughs> I can um, ask a question to start. Um, so the the public domain mapping, uh, this seems really interesting. I'm curious how how will the like um, the workflow editor prioritize projects to show to people? So like if a whole bunch of agencies all find this really exciting and want to get data mapped, um, is there like a process that prioritizes certain ones? Does it connect people to projects that are close to them that they're more likely to be familiar with or like tags that people are interested in? Like, how do you make sure that projects that are deemed important and who deems them important get worked on um, if there's more work to be done than, you know, whatever the pace of volunteers might be at? I can jump in on that one. Um, so a few things there. Um, we have had this question from a few agencies as well. You know, if they create a hundred tasks to map all the railroads across the US, how is that gonna be managed? Um, for one thing, we do have guidelines on the number of tasks that can be um, public and ready to be mapped at a time for it to solve that exact issue. We don't wanna have, um, you know, a hundred railroad tunnel tasks um, right on the front page, it's gonna, you know, prevent any other tasks from being seen. So um, there is guidelines on the number of tasks open at any one time, also to encourage um, existing tags to act, be completed to 100%. Um, additionally, um, there is different filters um, and oftentimes people will use the um, map search to find tasks that are local to them uh, and we have tons of channels that are available to those different interests, both geographic levels um, where local projects are um, promoted. So for example, Maggie mentioned the, um, the swimming pool project that we are doing in partnership with Rising Tide um, that has been really well supported through and promoted through the local NYC channel um, in our communications, as well as um, there's also topic specific. So with the tunnels project we're doing with the FRA um, are railroad mappers, uh, which is definitely a um, big community on our side. Um, they have been um, a target audience for that mapping. Um, so it'll be partially you know, supported in that promotion on our side, but also um, part of the onboarding process with these agencies is their understanding that they also need to be promoting um, participation. So for example, we've been working to pull in volunteers from the National Map Corps to, to support with our current efforts. So it's definitely a two-way street. We, you know, street, we won't be, um, you know, we'll be encouraging and promoting this through our channels, but also encouraging the agencies to promote it on their side as well to help expand the mapping community to not just existing mappers, but new mappers as well. Well, thank you. Uh, I have a question related to how uh, government agencies can use their existing data sets. Um, so if, like, for example, I have an existing data set and I want folks in OSM to validate that existing data set, is there a way for me to import that data set to OSM so folks can check that data? Oh, I could jump in on that one. Um, so importing data into OSM is very tricky, um, especially for new mappers. Um, a lot of the consensus of the community is that everything needs to be sort of hands uh, uh, validated before it gets imported. Um, but this is exactly the kind of use case that public domain map is for, is that you could take, um, you know, open data set uh, that's already in the public domain, uh, such as a government set, import it into public domain map, and then have crowdsourced people um, or just, just people around the world uh, work on that data set, do edits, add information, you know, update things, and then have it be revalidated by, you know, a, a trusted source, which, you know, the whole point of it is it takes much less time to, to look at data and make sure it's okay than to, to do the actual mapping. Um, so I hope that answers your question. Yeah, that does. Thank you.
and I'm really excited for Paul what's doing now. I'll provide a, an example for that. I mean, that's exactly what we're doing with the Federal Railroad Administration right now. Um, they provided their railroad lines for um, well, across North America, but specifically for Colorado. Um, they do have um, look points of where all the tunnels are, um, but what was missing in their data set was understanding where the start and end of all those tunnels are. So updating that um, those line that line data set um, to not just um, show where the railroads are, but along those railroad lines where those tunnels exist. So that's exactly what we're doing is we've brought in that Federal Railroad Administration data and then through public domain map, uh, volunteers are editing that data um, directly um, and improving it. And then um, the Federal Railroad Administration representatives are going to be the ones themselves validating and then checking the box that that is now authoritative data. I have a question in the chat. Um, is it possible for anyone to download the data after the task is complete? And the way the workflow will be is it, it won't be immediately downloadable by the public, but it will be available in two spaces, right? So once it goes back in OpenStreetMap, anybody can export the data or use it as a base map. And then on the on the admin side, and the reason we're mapping it in the public domain in the first place is that so it eventually ends up in our, our country's uh, public domain database. So it should be open data for all um, on, on the you know, whoever the PD map admin side is, you know, the FRA for this example is going to end up sharing out those tunnels as public domain data as well. So um, if you're interested in using the data, you'll have two different places to, to do it. One will just be a more immediate use, which is uh, OpenStreetMap. <laughs> I think we'll end up there first. This is great. I love more questions. And if anyone has any um use cases or ideas on how this could be used in New York, um, whether you're at the broader New York State or New York City, we'd love to hear this uh, or hear your examples or your ideas. Um, we are working with a few federal partners, but um, interested in hearing potential use cases, um, especially as we are working on these pilots and trying to improve the tool. We also want to make sure that we're accounting for different use cases as well. So um, please feel free to share those either by coming off mute or in the chat or emailing us later as well. And we do have time if anybody just has any questions about OpenStreetMap, if they want to see anything done or um, any other information, happy to take that time as well. Ivana, for your question, do you mean um, use cases from PDMap or OpenStreetMap for companies or collaborations? Just to clarify. Oh, sure. Um, Jess or Quincy, you want to take that? <laughs> uh, well, for the OpenStreetMap side, there's a lot of companies that are involved in the space right now. They'll um, they'll have teams that are mapping things that are important to them. For example, like Amazon has whole teams that are mapping um, driveways so they can get packages right to your door, um, especially in rural areas. Uh, even for smaller companies, they're those that will use the data, especially so they will, um, you know, try to try to make changes or do mapping uh, or contribute to tools because all the tooling is open source as well. Um, that will help them with however they're using uh, the data, whether they have an app um, or just a map style or something like that. Um, I don't know if uh, one of you wants to uh, talk about sort of the the use cases for PD map. Yeah, I'll, I'll add on also to the, the OSM side of things. A, a lot of uh, the companies that um, use OpenStreetMap um, both have internal teams contributing directly to the map, um, but also um, sometimes you know request support from uh, the community as well to contribute to that data. So uh, it's kind of the the beauty of this open infrastructure is um, it, it goes both ways, and there's a lot of collaboration as far as um, if there are immediate needs, then um, those requests can be made to the community. Um, and, and also not just um, companies, but organizations as well. A, a very um, well-known use case is when, you know, um, disasters occur. Oftentimes there's requests from, you know, United Nations, Red Cross, Doctors of Borders um, to fill gaps in their data sets as well. So it's it's um, broad as far as what those 
um, requests or use cases could look like. Um, as far as public domain map, um, right now we've been really just focusing on the use cases and needs of our federal partners, um, not just federal partners, but other levels of government as well. Um, but there is a lot of interest um, from companies on how they can support this work. So um, we're working on that right now in terms of um, how we want to um, collaborate with, with those companies for PD map. And then Maggie, there was a question about trails. And I think that's a good question for you as well. Uh, da -da -da, sure. Um, sorry, I was just getting the links for it. I was shared one of our playlists, but I mean, if you dive into our YouTube, you could probably find any use case under the sun uh, that's been presented by someone on how they use OpenStreetMap um, and leverage it. And also it is free and open source. Uh, we are, as a you know, this work, we are a nonprofit, so we do look for funding sources and, and support, um, but we don't charge for the data at all in the work. Um, best way to get involved with mapping trails. Uh, you know, this is going to be a huge national campaign, so there's going to be lots of ways to get involved. We are still in the um, formative phase of, you know, how to involve folks the most efficient ways. As you imagine, it's going to be probably a lot of people and hopefully getting involved in this initiative. But for now, if, if you want to head over to um, this site, it would be great to know, you know, how you'd like to get involved. We have a form to sign up um, and we're still, you know, really working to get stakeholders in the room. So uh, there's a lot of room for, for participation within the Trail Stewardship Initiative, depending on your interest. I would add to that, Maggie, that you can get involved with your local OpenStreetMap community, you know, uh, trails or otherwise. and um, Many cities, you know, around the country have them. Many states, or you can join our our Slack group, and there's a channel for each region of the country. Um, and if you have a question about trails, if you just want to ask people, like, what are the state of the trails in this area, and and how could I improve them, or how could I use them, um, that's an option as well. Yeah, and bringing around that question of um, company involvement um, and collaboration, trails is actually a really wonderful example. Um, because that working group that Maggie was talking about, um, that has been a space where there are volunteers who are just really um, avid about mapping trails, um, government representatives, but it's also been um, all trails and other companies have been right there in the room helping with solving this problem alongside us and then actively taking um, you know, those changes, recommendations, as Maggie showed with the rendering from the All Trails app um, and adapting the cha those changes right away. So that's been a really amazing collaboration between the public, the private sector um, in solving this challenge. Great. And also, yeah, I'm a part of the New York City Open uh, Street Map community. So, uh, yeah, you can also chat with me. I I've been mapping a ton of trails, actually, in Staten Island without the standard. So uh, I'm, I'm excited to get the standard uh, rolling and also importing uh, the Trails open data set. So uh, Jack, if you want to join the OSM Slack and we can, we can totally chat about it. And thanks for all your wonderful questions. Um, I have a question about the typical scale of a project or task. So like how, and I think you maybe briefly mentioned this earlier, but um, like how many tasks at a time are considered reasonable, like within one project, um, like how many instances or like what geographical area, um, and then how long does it usually take for the community to complete that, assuming there's like some level of interest in it? You cut off there. I wasn't sure if there's an additional part of that question. Uh, how far did you hear up until? <laughs> maybe it wasn't, maybe you wrapped it up there. Um, yeah, no, happy to, happy to answer that. Um, it largely depends on the features that are being mapped and um, the, um, the difficulty of the mapping task. So there's um, not necessarily strict guidelines. Um, there is maximums that um, the um, tool can handle as far as the number of tasks. I think it's 5,000 within a single project, um, but it largely boils down to um, kind of almost the psychology of volunteer contributions. Um, so we tend to, um, as part of the onboarding process, we like to train um, our um, project managers 
um, to design projects that feel achievable for volunteers. So um, when it comes down to an individual task, um, the like the square on the map that a mapper will be contributing to that really shouldn't take someone more than 15 to 20 minutes because they'll be discouraged if it takes longer than that or they might lose interest um, but as far as the size of the project um, we generally try to keep it within um, you know 100 to 200 different tasks and that's just because um, if you're going to keep volunteers coming back and contributing you want them to be able to see that what they're doing is making a difference and you know filling that, um, removing that percentage of completion along. So we try to break up larger projects into smaller achievable milestones. Um, and then what was the other part of that question? Oh, um, how long it takes for people to map the project. That is all over the place. Um, and it also depends on how well that project was set up and the promotion that's done, interest from volunteers in the community. Um, so some mapping tasks um, can be done really rapidly depending on the need. Um, for example, I'm pretty sure all the buildings in Puerto Rico were mapped in three to four days um, after Hurricane Maria um, in response to that, um, just because there was a high need there. Um, additionally, other projects, you know, um, Z doing organi organizing in New York City, you know, there's a strong community there. So putting out a call to say map sidewalks um, when there's a strong community that can go quickly as well, but it depends on a few different factors. Thank you. Awesome. If there isn't any more questions, I can stop the recording. And if anyone wants to pop in with like unofficial questions. Um, but yeah, this was a great presentation and thank you for, 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 for showing us, um, yeah, the public domain map and, um, and also trails. Thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot.